John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Hello again. Welcome back. My name is Stephen King. I'm your host this evening along with my friend John Noe, PhD. Uh, we are putting on a series called Greater Than We Believed. We thank you for coming back to visit us. This is video number 14 in our series. And if you just watched the last one, uh, you saw we kind of set this up already. But the name of this one is, tell me that again. What? When are. When are. Or were. Or were. The last days. days. Right. So when are or were the last days? So John's going to help us with some timeline issues here, along with scripture. And uh, John, let's just get right to it. Tell me, tell me what you got. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> I knew that would come up eventually. Okay. According to one of the most popular Christian. Yeah books written, left behind, and subtitled, A Novel of the Earth's Last Days. Yeah. When do you think they think the Earth's last days are or were? They think they're still ahead of us. Soon. Yeah, very soon. Anytime. Soon. The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. 1970s. Mm-hmm. Another very popular book, major mess, big seller, mm -hmm. billions or millions or I don't know how many have ever sold. Like Great Planet Earth. The movie, Left Behind. It was very entertaining. Yes. <laughs> how some people are going to be taken out of here mm -hmm. and some people are going to be left here to mm -hmm. suffer yes. during these last days. Well, Stephen... Do you realize, John, how many people get their theology from these movies and books? <laughs> <laughs> A lot. That's the problem. <laughs> All right. So what does Scripture have to say about the last days? Well, it has quite a bit, actually, Stephen. So let's take a look at Scripture. Okay. See what it has to say. And I'm going to start with 2 Timothy, written in probably 67 A.D. In other words, 37 years after Jesus' earthly ministry okay. and, and dying on the cross. 2 Timothy 3, chapter, uh, verse 1. But mark this, Paul writes, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now, let me stop right there before I go any further. This was written to real air-breathing, blood-pumping Per, uh, uh, human a, beings, yeah. a human, a human being, a Timothy, human. Timothy himself, and, and right. Timothy shared this, Correct. and then was shared with the churches. So sure. re real people back then, mm -hmm. over 1,900 years ago, right? Yes. And this was a letter. So we are now reading somebody else's mail. Mail, yeah. And the uh, classic, and if not ultimate, hermeneutical error is when you lift something out of context, stretch it like a rubber band, hmm. say 19 centuries and counting, and plop it down out here in the future and say, this is that. This. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. What's talk, what Paul's talking about here, we're living in. Yeah. In other words, they weren't. Yeah. Didn't mean anything to them. This is for us. <laughs> now, if you were reading this letter and you were back then, how would you understand this? This is this. <laughs> this is this. <laughs> He's writing to us. Yeah. You know, but here's how here, a preacher, for example, many preachers, or on on religious Christian religious television, mm -hmm. if they were reading this, it'd be something like this. Maybe if I can get up and do a pulpit, brother, do, do, do a parrot. <laughs> But mark this, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. You know, get that finger out yeah. there because you're pointing at you. Can I get an amen? You're not pointing <laughs> back then. Uh -uh. No, you're pointing. Okay. You. But mark this. There will be terrible times in these last days. Oh, yeah. Preach it, brother. Now, that's not what it says. The last days. But I would say, there will be terrible times in these last oh, days. Add a little, little. Uh, okay. Yeah. Totally miss it. Okay. You know. 
People will be lovers of themselves. Mm -hmm. Lovers of money, mm -hmm. boastful, <coughs> proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Mm -hmm. And everybody's sitting out there saying, Amen, brother. <laughs> Speech it, brother. Yeah. Preach it. <laughs> Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self control, brutal, mm -hmm. not lovers of the good. Treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, mm. rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power, brothers and sisters, you know what I'm talking about. Mm. Have nothing to do with them. Mm. Lifting it totally out of context, mm -hmm. stretching it like a rubber band, 19th centuries and counting, plopping it down out here in the future and creating a, taking it out of context and creating a pretext. Mm -hmm. This is that, mm -hmm. rather than this is this. So they're saying, finally, now, it's now is the last days after all this time, because none of these things applied until today. Today they apply, so today must be the last days, is what they're saying. And we are living yeah. in the last days, praise God, mm -hmm. because we're getting gonna, gonna be taken out of here. We'll talk mm -hmm. about that in, a, in a, sure. a, one of our videos we're doing today, a little later. And we're gonna get out of all our problems and all our anxieties and all the things that we don't like and, mm -hmm. and we're gonna skip the grave so we don't have to go through the dying process and all that kind of stuff. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, Lord, take me away. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and these poor suckers didn't. Right. Or nor anybody since then. <laughs> yeah. It's just us because we're so special. Yeah. Here's a good example of that. Okay. Now this is from a scholarly standpoint. This is, happens to be uh, William Barclay's commentary that we use at our Bible study, mm -hmm. our weekly Bible study. And by the way, if any of you ever come to Indianapolis, we have a weekly Bible study on Thursday mornings at a restaurant here in the northeast side of Indianapolis mm -hmm. and uh, from 8.30 till about 10, 10.30 usually. And you're welcome to come. If you want to come, Love email to us you. and we'll give you more information sure. and so forth. So uh, we talked about, in fact, we talked about this in our Bible study this morning, didn't we? Yes, we did. And we had quite a conversation, right? Boy, I tell you. <laughs> and what we looked at, or one of the things we looked at is, well, what is William Barclay? I, I keep wanting to say Charles Barclay. Yeah, well, reason. I don't know why I want sports it. for some reason. Well, I got started, you know, last video, Big Ten. You know, yeah, and, okay, and yeah, that's Club. it. Here, but here's how he puts it. Now, he puts it in kind of mild language, but it's still there. Yeah. I mean, he, he's not doing, you right. know, like, like I paramount, or what do you call that word? I don't know. Okay. He says this. This commentary on 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 1. The early church lived in an age when the time was waxing late. So far, so good. Okay. They expected the, the second coming. Okay. Okay. See our video number, what was it, four or five? Yeah. At any moment. So their expectations were all this stuff was going to happen within their lifetime. Yes. Scholars are pretty much agree with it. And what the church has done is developed delay theory and said, no, their expectations that were Holy Spirit guided had proven wrong. Well, that's usually problematic. Yeah. Hugely. Bigly. Yeah. Okay. Bigly. Okay. Bigly. Uh, second coming any more. Christianity was cradled in Judaism, yes. And very naturally thought largely in Jewish terms and pictures. Yes. Jews thought, uh, uh, Jewish thought had one basic conception. The Jews divided all time into this present age and the age to come. This present age was altogether evil. And the age to come would, would be the golden age of God, where everything would be hunky dory. Mm -hmm. Obviously, back then, it was evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what we're living in now is evil. Hmm. And one of these days, still. One of the, still. <laughs> yeah. And one of these days, we're going to have a golden age. Yeah. But not, not yet. The day of the Lord, uh, or in between, was the day of the Lord. A day when God would personally intervene and shatter the world. Where's my... Ah. Uh, great planet Earth. Late great planet, yeah. So see, see the bottom? What, what's on the bottom there? Well, it, it looks flames and it looks like the world on fire. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Complete destruction. That's right. Shatter 
Uh, where was I here? Uh, the day of the Lord will be presented by the time of the Lord. Where was I at here? Oh, intervene and shatter the world in order to remake it? Mm. In other words, the world that he created is not the way he wanted it to be because it got goofed up because he shouldn't have cast Satan to that garden. He should have cast him somewhere else or he shouldn't have put that uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil in there. He should just let, leave the trees. Or, you know, he's got to remake the world the way it should, should have been done in the first place. Remake the world. Uh, the day of the, that day of the Lord was to be preceded by a time of terror known as the Great Tribulation mm -hmm. nowadays, uh, when evil would gather itself for its final assault and the world would be shaken to its moral and physical foundations. It is in terms of these last days, not those last days, mm -hmm. but these last the days, yeah. this is that. You mm -hmm. see that again? In terms of these last days that Paul is thinking in in this passage, not living in. Isn't that what he says? He says, thinking. That's the word, thinking in this passage. Not living in. Right. Big difference. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. Let me fast forward here. There was to be a final showdown with the forces of evil. Hadn't happened yet. Nowadays, and this is written in the 1950s, Nowadays, we have to restate these old pictures in modern terms. See what he's doing? Yes, I can see that. Lifting it out of context, stretching it like a rubber band, 19th centuries and counting and plopping it down out here. When you take it out of context, you create a pretext. And that's a pretext. Okay. And he's great. Or, you, or somebody wants to say, if you lift it out of context, stretch it like a rubber band and plop it out here in the future, you, 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 you present a con. Which is exactly what it is. This is a con job yeah. that we've been getting. Nowadays, we have to restate these old pictures in modern terms. They were never meant to be anything else but visions. Hmm. In other words, he said, this wasn't reality back then. Well, the heck it wasn't. Mm -hmm. They were living in a heck of a lot more evil and bad times than we're living in. Hmm. In the United States and in Europe and, and, you know, and, and many other, most other countries around the world. It was horrible back there, their morals and things and that kind of stuff that they did. And the brutality that was inflicted upon everybody, the way they treated women and, you know, so forth, so forth, so forth. Uh, uh, they were never meant to be anything else but visions. We do violence to Jewish and to early Christian thought if we take them with crude literalness. Now, crude literalness means, well, he was writing to them and <laughs> That's who he was talking you, you, to. You know, the number one rule in, 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 in hermeneutics is <coughs> context, context, context. Right. And they're taking it down to context. He's, he calls that crude literalness. But they do enshrine the permanent truth that sometime there must come the consummation when evil meets God in head-on collision and there comes the final triumph of God. So that's how it's done. Hmm. Lifted down a context. All right. But remember, Stephen, when we read 2 Timothy and, and, and the other epistles of Paul, for example, we're reading somebody else's mail. Mm -hmm. So that's read somebody else's mail. Hebrews. Okay. Written, ri another letter written by, we think, Paul, but might have been his wife, Pauline. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's where we get Pauline theology yeah. from. No, it's a joke. It's okay. a joke. That's a theological joke. It's not funny. No, not at all. No, no. <laughs> but, it is, but it is a letter that was written. Mm -hmm. you know. And it starts off like this. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Now, we now know that that's what we call the Old Testament. Right. And that the, was their and the, past. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's when, he, that's when he spoke to the forefathers through the prophets in very time, various ways. But in these last days, he didn't say in those last days, he said in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now there, by inspiration, the writer of Hebrews affixes two specific events to the biblical time frame known as the last days. Number one, the time he was writing in, yes or no? Yes. And number two, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Yes. Because that's when God spoke to us by His Son. That's right. That's why He was born, lowered Himself, was born, 
uh, as a babe in a manger and you know grew up to be a boy and then a man and then the earthly ministry and dying on the cross and raised and ascended and we'll be talking more about that when we get into the into the greater Jesus and what Jesus is like and doing today mm -hmm. okay so these were the last days all right but they were the last days of what hmm. of what well they weren't the last days of planet earth a la Hal Lindsey and yeah you know late great planet earth and left behind people right Right. But they were the last days of something. What were they the last days of? Well, they were the last days, I'm going to contend, of the biggest thing that was ending at the time. What was ending at the time? Well, let's go back to the prophets who spoke to us back in the Old Testament. And let's go to uh, probably the key prophet regarding end times and those kind of things. And that would be Daniel. And Daniel gives us, Stephen, both the historical characteristic and defining moment for what the end times or the last days were all about in this chapter 12. And I'm going to pick this up here. Uh, uh, well, I'll pick it up in verse 2. Multitudes who sleep. Again, this is prophesying. 700 years before Christ. In Babylonian, Daniel's in Babylonian captivity. Okay. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. This is a prophecy of resurrection. That was to come. I'm going to fast forward now to verse 4. But Daniel, you, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Now notice it's time of the end, not end of time. Right. Huge difference. Big difference. And the Bible knows nothing about an end of time. Right. But a lot about a time of the end. And he's going to give us again the defining characteristic and historical setting in just a minute. Many will go here and there to, to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite side of the river. No big shakes there. I mean, people standing out here at White River on the banks of the river fishing all yeah, the time. Every day. Sure. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river. Whoop! Above the waters of the river. Doesn't say he was standing on a bridge, does it? Mm -hmm. So if it's hanging above, it might have been an angel. Could be. I think it was an angel. How long will it be? Now, how long is a, is a time question, right? Right. How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and lifted his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear uh, by him who lives forever. Now, when, when the Jews would use oath language and swear, that's not cuss. Right. You know, taking that, an oath. Taking yeah. an oath. They would raise the right hand. But this guy raises both his right hand and his left hand. means double, double intensification yeah. <laughs> of importance here. Uh, I heard him swear forever. It will be for a time, times, and a half time. Now, I'm not going to get involved in a lot of that. I've written about that in uh, both the uh, Unraveling the End and uh, uh, the Perfect Ending for the World. But the Jews saw their time as, 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 a, as a year. Mm -hmm. is based upon, you know, the sun and, and the moon. And, and that, that's how they govern time. So a time would be one year, times would be two years, and a half time would be a half year. How long, how long is that if That's you had a, three and a half total? Three and a half years. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know how long the siege of Jerusalem was in 66 to 70 AD? I do. It's three and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> I learned something on one of our other videos. <laughs> and here it is, the okay. defining characteristic in historical setting. For the one and only time of the end, the Bible consistently proclaims from Genesis mm -hmm. to maps. Okay. It would be when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, mm -hmm. all these things will be completed. So, question. What, who were the holy people? That's God's people, Jerusalem, uh, the Israelites. Right, who were in Babylonian captivity. Right. Their temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians, and, and the elites of, of, of the population had been taken in, into captivity. Right. And what, and, and, and what was their power? Well, they, were, they had exclusive uh, rights to pure worship to God, uh, even though they didn't have the temple at that time. It was through that temple arrangement. Right. They did, they did have it. Yeah. And then when they got out of Babylonian captivity, they'd go back and Right. They had to reestablish re reestablish by and rebuild the temple. But, right, right, right. And so that was their exclusive relationship with God. It was right. the only place on earth, as manifested by the temple complex, right. which was the only place on earth where acceptable worship to uh, the Creator God could, could be offered at mm -hmm. that time, you know, in, in that covenantal system, right? Uh, 
so there is a defining characteristic in a historical setting. It would be when the power of the holy people, the exclusive relationship with God, would be finally broken. It, notice finally. Right. It was not a one event thing. It was a process of things. Right. And what did Jesus say was going to happen to that temple complex uh, just before he was crucified? Oh, yeah. He's saying that it would not only be destroyed, but every stone, no stone would be left upon a stone. That's right. And when did he say that that would happen? Within that generation that was alive that day. Matthew 24? Yes. Verse 3, And Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? Now, when will this happen goes back to verse 2. When Jesus said, Do you see all these things? He asked, I tell you the truth. That's old language, by the way. Mm -hmm. I tell you the truth, or verily, verily, or truly, truly. Not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So they ask him, when will this happen? This destruction? Right. And it's a magnificent complex. Sure. One of the ancient wonders of the world back then and there. And he said, he said it will be torn down. Uh, not one stone will be left on another. When will this happen? When? what will be the sign of your parousia mm -hmm. or coming? And the end of the age. Not end of, of the, the world. world. Right. Another one of our mistranslation right. errors. That's right. a paradigm issue that's, that's led many people astray. And in fact, and it gives a long description here, which we don't have time to get into now. In verse 34, he says, I tell you the truth. Again, old language, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. This generation, he's saying that in 30 AD, mm -hmm. 66 AD, Jerusalem is surrounded by armies. Mm -hmm. which is one of the signs he told them to, to watch for. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of town. Right. Josephus, the eyewitness historian, uh, testifies in his writings that they did. And not a single Christian was killed in this, in this time of the end type prophecy. Also notice in verse 33, even so, Jesus said, when you see all these things, and, he, and, and we... When, or when you see all these things, you is them. Okay. You isn't lifting this out of context, yeah. stretching it in the 19th century, the counting and plopping it out here in the future and saying, this is that. No, this was this. Was this. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you know that it is near, uh, or that he is near. He is right at the door. That's when you see these things. Well, you know James writing 37 years later, or it should be some... Um, 30 years later, this is 30 A.D., James is writing in 60 A.D., and you know what James does, Stephen? He puts Judge Jesus at the door. Hmm. Now there's a door right there. Our viewers can't see it, but there's a door. Mm -hmm. You know what a door means when somebody's standing at the door? It means he's ready to come in. <laughs> he, I'm not making this up. Verse 9 in James 5. Don't grumble against each other, brothers. Now he's talking to real air-breathing, blood-pumping people. Right. And writing to, you know, real air-breathing, blood-pumping people. Don't grumble and, uh, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge, Judge Jesus, mm -hmm. is standing at the, at door. the door. Man, that's 60 AD. Mm -hmm. 66 AD, Jerusalem surrounded by armies for the first time. 68 the second time. 69 the third and then and, and 70 the fourth time it was too late to get out. Hmm. The defining characteristic in the historical setting of the one and only end the Bible consistently proclaims from Genesis to Maps, Daniel and others, and the writer of Hebrews says, in these last days, affixes that time. Isn't that something? Now, another, as long as I'm all the way up, James, let's just go to Peter, right? 1 Peter 4, written in that same 65 to 67, 68 AD range. Peter says this, 1 Peter 4, 7, The end of all things is at hand. Grab it. At hand. Near is yeah. a sloppy translation. Yeah. You know, as we've talked about before, that house over there is near, but this, yeah. this cup is this at is hand. And within reach. Yeah. yeah. Jesus said, the one who betrays me is at hand. At hand, yeah. He said the Passover feast was at hand. It was the next day. Right. So Peter is saying, by inspiration, the end of all things is at hand. Ten verses later, he tells us the same thing that Daniel prophesied. Verse 17 of 4, For it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. 
or the family of God. Jesus said, "My," referring to the temple, when he turned over the tables and mm -hmm. drove the money chain, he said, my, my father's house is a house of prayer. That's what he's talking about, the temple. Again, all this perfectly fits together when we keep it in its proper, divinely determined time context. Okay. Here's the big... Here's the big... Uh, well, let me tell you one other thing. One other thing. Back, back to Matthew 21. So Jesus said, you know, not one stone would remain on another. Yeah. He also said and told them... Uh, essentially that the new could not fully come until the old was fully removed. We had this present age and we had the age to come. Mm -hmm. And they were both present at the same time during that time frame. That's why Paul talks about how, how the ends, plural, of the ages has come upon you in Corinthians somewhere. I can't remember exactly where that was. But ends, the, 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 the back end of the, uh, the, this present age and the front end of the age to come were overlapping at that time. Mm -hmm. The ends, plural, of the ages. Hmm. That's why you have ends plural and ages plural, because you had to overlap. Yeah, like, and that's that's what they were in in this time. And Jesus also told them in Matthew 21, <coughs> for example, referring to this leaving uh, leaving desolate. Jesus says in Matthew 21 verse 43, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. From the Jews he's talking to and given to another people who will produce its fruit what and then in, then in verse 45 relates that when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus parables they knew he was talking about some hmm. future generation 19 centuries removed and counting Stephen, this is not funny. This is serious stuff. <laughs> Man, you know how many people believe that? Sad. He was talking about them. All this stuff is talking about them. Yeah. They were the ones living in the last days. But here's the big objection. No one, no one can know the day or hour. The day or hour. No one. Why is that? Because Jesus said so. How are you going to argue with that? He said so. Matthew 24, verse 36. No one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son of Man, but only the Father. Even Jesus didn't know the day or hour. I mean, how arrogant, John Noe. You're sitting there saying, <laughs> you know the day and hour. You know that that was it. That, that this, this, this was this. This wasn't that. Right. Because nobody can know. Jesus didn't know. Nobody can know. John knew. John knew. Jesus didn't know. I mean, he said he didn't know. Don't ask me why he didn't know. I mean, he had lowered himself, you know. Sure. But, and he knew a lot of other things, but he also knew that he could only do what he saw the Father doing. Right. Well, he, maybe the Father didn't tell him. <laughs> you know, when, when the day of the hour. He knew the generation, didn't he? He did. Verily, verily, I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass away till all these things have happened. He knew that. Sure. But he didn't know the day or hour. It's just like in, in a birth. In fact, he compares it to birth pains. You know, birth of a baby. We can't know the day or hour, mm -mm. for sure. I used to have a granddaughter who had a baby, and she had it during the 38th week, when normally time would be 40. About 40. And they didn't know the day or hour. I mean, they were up all night, you know, waiting on the hour. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus didn't know the day or hour. But John knew the day and hour. Or knew, knew, at least he knew the hour. If we turn to First John, uh, bear with me just a moment here. Where are you, First John? First John, chapter two. He says, "Dear children, this is the last hour." Now that's an emphatic statement, isn't it? Yes. A declarative statement. This is the last hour. Then he talks about some Antichrist stuff here, and then he says it again in the same verse. This is how we know it is the last hour. Now how in the world could John have known that this was the last hour when Jesus said no man knows the day or hour? The angels didn't know. Even Jesus himself didn't know. How in the world could John know it's the last hour? Now, let's don't be 
crassly lib uh, literal here. I mean, he didn't say the last 60 minutes. Right. I mean, the 60 minutes television show wasn't even known about in that back sure. in that time, right? Uh, but be, meaning, the, this is it. You know, this is what, what it's all been talking about. That's what Daniel was talking about. This is what the prophets have been talking about. We're at the threshold. You know, he, he's he, Jesus has already been standing at the door. Jerusalem's already been surrounded by armies. This is written in 67. We've already had one surrounding of Jerusalem by armies already. Uh, maybe two. <laughs> you know, or was that close? How in the world could he know that it was the last hour? Well, the reason that he can know, Stephen, is something very huge happened between Jesus saying no man can know the day or hour and John saying it is the last hour. It is the last hour. And what was it that happened that transpired in between those two times that made all the difference and changed this knowing ability? I would say Pentecost when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And what was one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit that enabled this knowledge to flow? teaching. The Holy Spirit would teach them. That's right. John 16, 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth comes, Jesus talking here in red letters. Well, he wasn't speaking in red letters. <laughs> or written in red letters. But when he, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Hmm. Stephen, that's how John could know. The Holy Spirit told him. By inspiration. Is that too hard to believe? No, it's very believable. So, if their expectations prove wrong, and, and scholars are readily in agreement that Every New Testament writer, John and, 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 and James and all of them, Paul, expected all these things to take place in their, within their lifetime. And obviously they were given the Holy Spirit to guide them to all truth and tell them the things that were to come. So if their Holy Spirit guided and told expectations have proven false by 19 centuries and counting, how in the world could we trust them to convey other aspects of the faith along to us accurately? I mean, this is a huge conundrum. Really? Huge. This is why people discredit the, 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 the accuracy of Scripture. It's because, because of all these things didn't happen when they're supposed to happen. So, what has the church done? Besides stick their head in the sand and ignore it. Do you know what they've done to try to get around all this? I think we talked about that once before the word delay comes to mind. And we we showed this. Yep, my sticky note off here. Okay. Dictionary of Bible prophecy and end times. Mm -hmm. Yep. They developed what's called delay theory. And that's closed with this. Okay. All right. So I want you to read this for me, like sure. like you did, like we did in a future, uh, previous video. But but this so ties in with this because our subject is when are or were the last days, and what mm -hmm. we're saying is those last days were back then. Yes, those last days are behind us, not ahead of us. Those last days are past, not future. And that's wonderful, great news. Oh yeah, <laughs> wonderful, great news. Except somebody said, "But I'm looking forward to getting out of here." Well, why don't you get your bottom in gear? <laughs> That, that'll that, that'll be much more beneficial for you in the afterlife if you get your bottom gear rid of sitting around here doing this stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, you want to read this? Well, I got it marked right there. Just This is delay theory that was invented to try to get around all this. The term parousia refers to the second coming of Christ. The delay of the parousia refers to the assumption by some New Testament scholars that the first generation of Christians, which was in A.D. 30 to 70, believed that Christ would return before their deaths. When that didn't happen, in other words, when the parousia was delayed, the early believers were supposedly thrown into a crisis of faith. Yeah, and that's up and read that one right there, too. Okay, so... Uh, a strong hints that there could be a delay between some of the immediate partial fulfillment of his prophecies and the ultimate final fulfillment of his prophecies. 
finally, the early church developed the already not yet eschatological perspective in order to deal with the delay of the parousia. And people say, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. <laughs> Until you realize that scripture tells us in at least three places, one of them, Hebrews 10, 37, for in just a very, 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 Two very, very little while he who is coming will come and will not delay. Mm -hmm. Habakkuk 2, 3. Also is another one. Now Habakkuk's one of those ones that's hard to find, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, come on, I'm going to find it here. Where, there it is. Uh, yeah, I had a little thing on. He says this. Uh, then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. The revelation awaits an appointed time. Who do you think appointed it? God. <laughs> yep. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It's, it will certainly come and will not delay. And there's another whole section in Ezekiel talking about there will be no delay. That's Ezekiel 12, 21 through 28. I won't bother to go there and read that because we're, we're a little beyond time here okay. on this one. Uh, so in conclusion, Stephen, the last days spoken of in the Bible are behind us, mm -hmm. not ahead of us. Our past and are not future. We are now living in the, goal, in, the, in the kingdom age, in the age to come, because that's what the Messiah was bringing in when he was lowered and made himself, uh, 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 allowed himself to be born in the, the uterus of a little Jewish virgin girl. Mm -hmm. Grew up, became a boy, and who taught in the synagogue, a man who taught throughout uh, the Palestine, Palestine area over there, and then died on the cross for us, was raised, and so forth, so forth, so forth. And now we want to take a look at the Jesus who is greater and above all that, who is the contemporary Christ, who is the Christ, the Jesus today, and man, is this going to be something. Mm -hmm. I'll let you close this out. Okay. Thank you, John. Folks, this is exciting stuff. Uh, I'm so glad that you came to visit us again. I hope that this has uh, whet your appetite for what's to come. If you think about the fact that the last days are behind us, then we have to wonder, well, what's ahead of us? What are we doing now? I ask the same questions. Good point. So, that has got some good, really wonderful answers. Uh, this is a progressive thing. It takes time to go through all these things. And I've had the privilege of being around John and reading some of his books, and I've got a few answers already in my head. I'm not going to spoil it for you, though. <laughs> We'd like for you to keep coming back. Be open to the things that are said, but we ask you to verify what we say by uh, your prayer to God to give you guidance and also to do your due diligence on scriptural study. Meanwhile, our series is called Greater Than We Believe. And the whole purpose of this is to help us to understand that the God we worship is so much more than we've been led to believe through the way we've been raised and with the type of Christianity we've been taught all our life. There's so much more there, so much more wonderful. And the things that we can be looking forward to in our earthly future here, the things we can look forward to in the, uh, on the other side, it boggles the mind. Mm. And uh, I am excited about this, the, how we're turning our study now into this greater Jesus. And I invite you to come back and to watch the, more of our series. And uh, please look at the end of the video to see where you can get in touch with John or his in the ministry through either the website or by his email. Please take the time to shoot off a little email or a letter to John. Let him know what you think about the videos. If you've got some uh, concerns, please let us know. If you've got questions you'd like us to answer here in one of our videos, we're going to have a question and answer video. It'll come up sometime, and we're just going to bring up some questions that you viewers have come up with, and we'll try to give you some timely uh, answers to those. Meanwhile, thank you for coming. Please be stay tuned for the next um, in fact, when you go to YouTube and you see these videos, be sure that you hit that subscribe button because we want to make sure you get all of them. Meanwhile, John, thank you again. God bless you all. We'll see you soon. Good night. That was a good, that was a good one. I like that. We went a little long. We did. How long? Oh, almost 40 minutes. <laughs> You're going to be I didn't in trouble. Mean, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. So keep it under 30. Keep yeah. it under 30. 
Yeah. Oh well. Oh well. And and you got to quit bullying me. <laughs> Did I bully you? Not at all. But I, when he wrote that to you, I think, okay, what did you see that I didn't see? When you ask me that, and I'm reading that, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not sure what, he's, what he thinks he sees. The, the questions you ask, I thought we had a real good, just an interchange of, you know. And if you ask me something, I don't know. I, just, I don't know. <laughs> or I'll, I'll venture a guess. That's what people do in a conversation all the time. But I just thought it was funny that he would say that. Just like now I say, well, if you were a real Christian, you know, we know where that comes from. So. <laughs>